Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, those of you who are joining us in person here at the beautiful seminar room of the Department of Political Science, we have a number of uh, graduate, undergraduate students, senior members of the faculty joining us here live in Montreal. And of course, a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us from different parts of the world on Zoom. My name is Chaba Nikolaini. I'm a professor at the Department of Political Science and also director of the Azriel Institute of Israel Studies. And it is in my latter capacity that I have the pleasure and the honor of welcoming to the screen as well as to the room, our visiting scholar and speaker from Israel, Dr. Lilak ben Tzvi, who is spending some research time at the Institute uh, in order to study and advance her research further on the nature of civic consent uh, in Israel. And that is actually very much the topic of her presentation this afternoon. Um, we only have a short time, about an hour, uh, for including the Q&A. So let me get to the point straight by introducing Dr. Ben Sui briefly and then give her as much time uh, as possible and as she needs in order to tell us about this uh, burning issue, issue of burning significance in contemporary Israel. So Dr. Ben Svi is a research fellow at Jerusalem's Shalom Hartman Institute. She recently completed her PhD at the University of Haifa, where she is also currently teaching about the public sphere in the modern state. Her general research interest uh, is in the studying the ability to create and preserve civil consent in the modern state in general, considering the constant cultural division and the permanent existence of minority groups. Dr. Ben Svi is confronting this question specifically by analyzing the political theory of the late Yeshayahu Leibovitch and his attitude to the political sphere, the state of Israel, and more broadly, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, each of these issues could would be enough for a dissertation and for a whole semester. Um, so Dr. Ben Svi, we hope that in the half an hour or so, you can still tease us to some of the important findings and issues, food for thought that we should all uh, be informed about and, and excited about. So uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being uh, here in Montreal. And the floor and the screen are now yours. Thank, thank you. you so much, uh, Chaba, for the presentation. I'm not sure it will be only 30 minutes. I will do my best. It's, it, I think it will be a bit more, uh, but we'll see. So I was already introduced. So I, all, all I will say is that I, my field is political science and my work is in the field of political theory. And what I will present now is in a way the main idea of my PhD. And my PhD deals with civil consent, with the terms to create and keep civil consent in, more, in a modern state. And I wrote about the way we as citizens a conceive civil consent in a democracy, and how what we may think that civil consent means is not necessarily what happened in uh, reality. And I'm going to demonstrate my arguments on a specific democracy, which is the state of Israel, which is also known as the Jewish state. So Israel is a case study for a modern democracy. Although, of course, when we are saying that Israel is a, is a can we say that Israel is a liberal democracy is a different question, which I also address in my PhD. So in general, although Israel has the boundary issue and the, of course the Palestine, uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, still we are saying I'm addressing it as a democracy. Um, and it's also a unique and distinct case on its own, but I will try to speak as general as I can be and just demonstrate what I want to argue on Israel. And I want to share with you the idea, my idea of civil consent in the light of recent political events of Israel. Now, these events demonstrate my point, I believe, from the one hand, but also what I'm about to demonstrate is something that happened after I finished my dissertation. So in a way, it shows me that not only that the political philosopher, which I realize on, which is Shara Lebovich, not only that he was right, of course, I think, he was right, but also that he was right more than I understood. And I'm not saying this is a good thing for the politics and society of Israel. I'm actually a bit or a lot worried about how things in Israel right now. And basically, I'm presenting you my postdoc thought and idea, which I'm elaborate here on the Israeli Institute and also at Hartman. And 
So first, I really just want to say to Professor Nicolani, thank you so much for this welcome. It's been so great and pleasure to be here also to all the people that are uh, here, to Corey and, and to Wendy. It was so nice that I'm actually considering staying here until the next election in Israel, mm -hmm. which, you know, also probably be in more couple of months, but so that I'm supposed <laughs> to come uh, to vote next week in Israel, but now I have in second thought about it because it's been very, very nice uh, to be here. So let's start with uh, the obvious question, which is what is the to me what does this mean to have civil consent in a democracy and why is that so important? And a well-known Canadian philosopher, Charles Taylor, he explained why in a democracy in particular, Larry, we must have civil consent and some sort of you know, unity and solidarity more, more than other regimes, democracy depends on the citizen's endorsement. And it's crucial for it that we, the citizen, have an agreement between us. And the thing is that when we, you know, we have to circle something and say, okay, we are all agreeing about this. But the moment, the moment we are doing this and we are circling something, there is a good chance someone somewhere will be left out and say, no, I cannot agree about this. And when someone is left out, so again, we have less agreement and less solidarity, but we, if we want to agree about anything, so nobody will be left out, but then we won't have an agreement. So we need to balance in a way in a democracy, they need to get an agreement about something, but still to get it as inclusive as you can. And a democracy as a modern state, you have people with different opinions and values and beliefs and goals, and you need to take this all into consideration. Actually, in any state you have this, but in democracy, you're supposed to care about this fact of pluralism and different and uh, uh, goals and beliefs and communities you have in your state. So in my research, I went to the mainstream, which tried to create civil consent, I mean, theoretically speaking, and this is liberalism. Uh, liberalism, I think, is the mainstream, not only, I think, is the mainstream that try to talk about civil consent and explain how it works. And also, I, mean to the, I went to the main philosopher thinker in the 20th century that did such a big effort to explain how an agreement like that would, should work. And this is John Rawls. And Rawls, yeah, this, I said it would be about the Jewish state, so now we come back to civil consent. And, okay. So Ross is talking about the need of any democracy to have civil consent, to have a consensus among citizens. And this is important if you want to, you know, have a stable, prosperous society that continue to exist for years and decades. And this consent Ross is talking about is a consent about the basic structure of society, which means the political, economic, social structure of society and that this institute, the way this institution acts, so we can recognize them as just, as fair, as giving the same treatment to everybody and giving the same opportunities, but mainly as, as fair. And in order for us to recognize this institution as citizens to say, okay, this is fair, this institution are right, we need to agree about something. And this something Rawls is saying, and I like this quote very much, he's saying, let's agree about the minimum. What is, the question is, what is the list that must be asserted? And if it must be asserted, what is the least controversial form? Because Rawls, like any other liberal, he understands that it's very hard to agree in, in a state when you have different kinds of values and goals and what I just mentioned before. So okay, let's just agree about the minimum. What is the minimum that you have to agree about in order to have this stable society that we can cooperate with each other and also saying this minimum in needs to be values. We need to agree about the minimum values that will enable us to create civil consent. And this minimum will also be moral, liberal, and political, which mean moral, liberal, and political values, which only applies on what we call the political sphere, only about the political institution. Also saying you do this, you create stable society of citizens who cooperate with each other and everybody can work, it can be happy and live happily ever after. And now Rolls got a lot of criticism because that's only means in political theory that he did a very good job. 
And all this criticism was saying a lot of things, which I don't have the time to go over them, but very in general critics that Rawls got was basically saying either this is not enough to agree about, like this is too minimum, or this is not working because you're not taking into consideration things like nationalism or multiculturalism or the diversity. And it got criticism in it was addressing them, but still I think that Rawls attempt is allegedly the most significant attempt to create and talk about agreements, theoretically speaking, in a modern in a modern democracy, liberal democracy or in democracy which in, in some degree is is liberal. And what I did and what I'm doing is, is I looked at all of this and then I say, okay, let's try to say something else about the whole concept of a green in a state. And I was I'm using Ishaya Levovich work. And now Lebovich was a Jewish philosopher, philosophic. Uh, he, most of his life was living in Israel, although he was born in Europe, in Riga, and then moved to Germany. And then he was working and living in Israel. He was a well-known figure over there. Uh, he was a professor to chemistry and biology, but that's that's not the point. What I was caring about is that basically his political work. And he wrote mainly about the idea of the Jewish state, and about the Jewish people now they have in the States. So in a way, it was the opposite of Rawls, because Rawls was speaking in general, although I guess Rawls was thinking about the United States mainly when he was talking about a, a democracy, and Levovich was writing about the Jewish state, and I talk, took his work, and I try to present it as, as general as I can be, and to put it against Rawls. I could do it because they have similarities in other things, like they're both Kantian, and they have similarities that enable me to make them to talk with each other, although, of course, in real life, they never uh, spoke with each other. And what Lebovich is saying, that the very effort to create an agreement about the political sphere with values, the very effort to talk about an agreement upon values is very problematic, not to say even wrong. So Leibovitch is saying, we can agree about you know, needs, we can, agree, we can agree about facts, but we cannot agree about values in the political sphere. This is very problematic. Now, let's put aside for a moment this interesting dichotomy is doing like putting values against needs and, and facts and assuming that we can all agree about needs and facts. Obviously, you would never be in a pandemic if you think we agree about facts and, and things like that. But let's assume that we can agree about it and just stay with values. Why it is so problematic to agree about values? Because of how Lebovich see the political sphere. Okay, this is Lebovich. And this is how we see the political sphere, too. He is he see the political sphere in terms of power as very dangerous, even demonical sphere. Now, Rawls, although he was a liberal thinker, he's also, when he speaks about the political, he's talking the, about the political, about the institution, in terms of power, he understands that the political works in a way very much with power, in power terms. But even so, liberalism still believes that we can create agreement, we cooperate with each other, we can talk about justice uh, inside the political sphere, but Leibovitch is not, did not see this. All he see was improper use of power, improper use of force, and he was very, very afraid about bloodshed, about the political sphere, we do horrible things, and what he thought that any attempt to create an agreement inside a democracy upon values, any attempt to agree once and for all. This is a phrase Rawls like very much to say, like, let's agree about something once and for all and enough already with all this debate. Let's agree, close it, and everybody will go to the home and live happily. Let's have like an hour and harmony and things like that. And Lebovich was like the opposite. Every time we try to agree about something from a value from a value aspect, 
when we talk about values, this is dangerous and it only ends in one way. And this is fascism for Lebovich. It was very like no compromise on this soul. So any, when you take values and you put it inside the political sphere and you take, when you give the state permission to speak in the name of values, this is fascism, that's it. There was no, and why? What Lebovich thinks that happened when we talk about values inside the political sphere? What, why is so bad that the state speaks in the name of, or act in the name of values? So first of all, the state can do hard and horrible things in the name of values. It can, the state or the institution can do whatever it wants and say, I did it in the name of, in the name of freedom, in the name of equality or whatever. Now, although Lebovich was very afraid of it, this is happening all the time. Like states, any state is using values. If you have education system, if you have health system, if you have an army, every state speaks and acts in the name of values. This is even in a way a natural thing to do. Otherwise, how else it, it can act? But Lebovich was not a proof of that. He could say, okay, you can speak, uh, um, you can speak in the name of needs, you can speak in the name of facts, you cannot speak in the name of values, which is of course problematic, but he didn't care so much about reality. But this is what he was saying. This is bad, this is dangerous, even if it's necessary and even if it's happening, this is very, you need to be very, very careful about it. But, and it goes much more than on, than that, because when you agree about values as political and say, okay, now these values are political values. You give the state permission to use them <clears throat> any way it wants. Now the state can also change the original meaning of a value. It can empty the value from its original content, if it has one, and put in new meaning that enable it to gain more power and allegedly we, the citizen, won't be able to say anything because we already agreed about this. We said this is an agreed value. Now, we may not even recognize that the state is doing this, that the political state is doing this because it's the political. It's smart, it's powerful, it's demonic. And this is why Lebovich claim all we have is to agree to disagree. All we have to do is to have an ongoing discussion and even an eternal struggle about our shared values. Now, this struggle is happening inside society in what we may call the public sphere. And this struggle is first and foremost against the political, against the political institution to make sure the political is not taking over our values, using them, reshaping them for its own purpose. Now, I think what may be good now that I will give examples of what I'm claiming. So I'm going to look about the reality in Israel. I want to give you two examples of what I was saying. Now, now as I say, as I said, Israel is a Jewish state. Now put aside what does that mean that Israel is a Jewish state? This is a very, very big question. But even if we agree that Israel is the state of the Jew, of the Jews, of the Jewish people, this is on also still big issue. And one issue in Israel is conversion, Giu, because Israel is allegedly a Jewish state. Like as I said, what does that mean? It's not religious. Israel is not a religious state, although it's not totally secular, but it's not also not religious. And we may know what we know what Jewish values mean from Jewish traditional point of view. Although inside the Jewish world we have different approach and views, of course. But what exactly is the job of the political sphere, which called Israel of all of this? Lebovich was very, very worried about this unclear situation that he, we are having a Jewish state and we are saying this is a Jewish, but we're not exactly defining this. And what does that mean is that the state, the political sphere, which called the state of Israel, can use, Lebovich was claiming this is what Israel is doing because it's not religious. So it's using religious values, just emptying them from their religious 
religious content and now presenting them in a new secular and modern way. And he was very, he was horrified from that. And when you have a Jewish state, becoming a Jew in a Jewish state is a political issue. I'm not going to elaborate about so a lot, but that's mean to become a Jew, which is something that people are doing all over the world if they want, but to do it in a Jewish state is a political scene. And what does that mean? The Jewish tradition, that the Jewish tradition and values belong now to the political and the political can shape them maybe in a new way. Now, my example here is the current government in Israel, they want to, they try to bring a law, a new law regarding conversion. Now you can ask me what exactly this law of conversion mean and how it will change the reality in Israel. And I will tell you, I don't know, because I tried like a lot and I teach conversion myself in Israel. I, I'm a teacher uh, uh, of conversion, so I'm supposed to understand this topic and still, I wasn't able to understand enough what this new law exactly mean. Nobody, I think, exactly understand, but it was like a big issue and debate in Israel. So what happened here is that the chief rabbi of Israel, Harav Lau, he was against this new law and he was having an interview. And he was saying, this is here up against the law. He said, with all the respect, even if the Israel parliament will determine that a man with a fever of 43 degrees is healthy, that is not true. And even if they pass a law that you don't need seven to erect a building, that won't happen. The same in conversion. The Israeli parliament. <coughs> the Israeli parliament is not the one to determine who is Jewish. A Jew is a person that takes upon himself the burden of Torah and Mitzvot and joins the Jewish people. Now, what he basically said that if you want to become Jewish, this means you are taking upon yourself something. Now, this the Jewish tradition calls to and mitzvot. So the chief rabbi say, you want to change it and say that conversion is something else now and becoming a Jew is something else and Jewish is, or Judaism is something else. You can say whatever you want that won't change reality. The, instant, the interesting here, I think, is the comment he got from, this is Yulia Malinowski. She's a, a Chabad Knesset. She's a parliament member of the coalition from a party called Israel Veitenu. I don't know how much you know about Israeli politics, but the head of this uh, of her uh, party is Avigdor Lieberman, and she came against the chief rabbi. And she say in an interview over the weekend, the chief rabbi of Israel claimed that a Jew is only a person that takes upon himself the burden of Torah and Mitzvot. According to the Hanover rabbi, this means that all Jews who don't keep Torah and Mitzvot are not Jewish. That is good to know. And thank you for the clarification. We will continue from here. So basically what she was saying, I, I don't want to say that she was lying, but she said something which was obviously not true. She said that the chief rabbi say that all the Jews in Israel, which are secular, are not Jewish, according to the chief rabbi. Now, this is of course not true because from a tra Jewish tra in Jewish tradition, if one's born as a Jew, there is no way to stop being a Jew. In order to stop being a Jew from a traditional, I'm not talking about how you define yourself. You can define yourself in any way you want from the traditional, the tradition sees you as Jew, unless you do something so, I don't know, try to hurt all the Jews in the world, something like that. Only then there is a discussion if you are still Jew or not. Otherwise, you can do whatever you want with your life you are still a Jew. So to say that the chief rabbi said that all the Jews which are not keeping to eye mitzvot are not Jewish, this of course, he didn't say that. But what she meant to say that, if the chief rabbi is claiming that in order to, take, to become Jew, you need to take upon yourself this Jewish tradition, this means that the already existing Jews are not Jewish because some of them, a lot of them, I don't know how you can measure it, they are not they are taking upon themselves this. Now, this is not true. She got a lot of responses and everybody told her, you didn't understand. Now, of course she understands. She's not stupid. And she said, no, I understand perfectly. You didn't understand. This is what he really means. It really means that you are not Jewish. Of course, 
Again, he, he could not say that because this is from a halakha point of view, from a Jewish traditional point of view, this is not true, and he's the chief rabbi. So I don't think, I cannot imagine how he could imagine saying that. So the thing is, what, what I think happened here, that she said it, she had a point. She wanted to claim something. And what she wanted to say is, I will take the existing definition which will always has been of becoming a Jew, of conversion, I will rephrase it. I will empty the original content, which will take upon yourself something. Even if you are doing a conservative or reform a conversion, you will take upon yourself something. And she said, no, I will rephrase it. And I will use the original values and idea of Judaism, conversion, everybody, everything stayed the same. But now I'm presenting it in a new way, which will suit for me and to wh who I want to hear me and who I want to vote for me. So I'm not saying that in the political sphere, you cannot speak in the name of values because we are doing it. But what I'm claiming that in when we want to create an agreement, we need to compromise, like we can't have it all. So the political sphere has this tense to rebuild and to do even a deconstruction of values and to give them new meaning in order to gain political power. I think this is what exactly what she is doing here. And I think that only significant public sphere and a real struggle of values can enable us to fight such a thing. If I will have more time I can I will elaborate for that how much time um you have three minutes to half an hour okay so that's so fine. maybe another 10 minutes if yeah, yeah yeah so I I have another example which is relating to anti-semitism so allegedly we as as an Israeli I as and as a Jewish I always assume that, of course, anti-Semitism is something we should talk about and discuss and debate. But I always assume this is more or less very clear what is anti-Semitism is. And last year, uh, on the seventh gathering of the Global Forum of Combat Anti-Semitism, uh, Yair Lafid, who is the Prime Minister of Israel today, he he was he spoke about anti-Semitism, and after he gave a speech, he published in Hebrew what he was saying in English on Facebook, and I went to the original. You can find what he said on Facebook, and I took, I, I, I couldn't present everything, so I took some of the sentences which I, I thought was very interesting, and I don't know if how much you could, no, you can see it, okay. Yeah. So this is what he was saying. He was saying, it's time for us to start telling the right story about the anti-Sedema. It's time for us to tell the world what we are facing. Anti-Semitic were not only in the Budapest ghetto. He's referring here, here to his own story as uh, his father was a Holocaust survivor. He was on the Budapest ghetto. So first he was talking about his own uh, father and then he was talking about this. The anti-Semitic were also slave traders who threw people bound together with chains into the sea. The anti-Semite was the Hutsu, the Hodos in Rwanda who massacred Tutsis. The anti-Semite is people who beat LGBT people to death. The anti-Semites are people who hang people, not because of what they did, but because of who they are, because of how they were born. The fight is not between anti-Semites and Jews. The fight is between anti-Semites and anyone who believes in the values of equality, justice, and liberty. Anti-Semitism is racism. So let's talk to everyone who truly opposes racism. Anti-Semitism is extremism. So let's work with everyone who is scared of extremism. Now, uh, his uh, speech was, there was a big storm in Israel about his speech because this is not the way you usually see anti-Semitism. Basically, what the Prime Minister of is saying is, is that anti-Semitism is everything. Everything which is bad is anti-Semitism. So in a way, it's like saying that anti-Semitism is nothing. 
because everything and everyone can be anti-Semitism. Now, how can we know, how can we find this anti-Semitism, anti-Semite people? Lepid is explaining that the fight is between anti-Semite, which is obviously bad, and anyone who believes in the values of equality, justice, or liberty. Now, I never met someone who told me, you know what, I don't care about uh, equality, justice, and liberty. I'm Darth Vader. I never met someone who said that. Most people believe in this thing, but the thing is that we're not agree about what does it mean to have equality, justice, and live in a society, and, what, and how we achieve liberty. So to say something like this is very, very general. And then, then he say that anti-Semitism is racism, which is basically, yeah, true. So let's talk to everyone who truly opposes racism. Now, how can you know who is truly opposed? This is very subjective. This is like to you to decide who truly opposes racism and who is racist. There is no clear definition anymore of who is racist or who is anti-Semite. And also anti-Semitism is extreme. So let's talk to everyone who is scared of extremism. Again, most people are afraid of extremism. The, the, the question is, what is extremism? I was walking in the road here like this. I didn't see anyone who was wearing this like me. I felt like, in a way, I'm, I don't know if extremist, I'm, some people were staring because, you know, in Israel, this is like, this is so normal. A lot of people are wearing this. So this is very subjective. How do you know who is radical? How do you know who is very extre- extreme? So this is for Lapid to decide now who is the bad people and who is the good people. And I guess it won't shock you if I say that the most common phrase that he used is people from the opposition is ext- extremists. Extremist radicals people. He called them radical. All the people are fighting against him in the opposition are radical. So I'm not saying it is saying they are anti-Semite, uh, they are anti-Semite. Of course not. But if you just redesign and reshape and rebuild everything from scratch in order to, to gain political power, there is a reason why you publish it in Hebrew. So um, we have to agree about this because. That sounds very, yeah, you know, very true that we need to fight with uh, the, all the hate and all the people who want equality. This is right, but it doesn't say anything. Now, this reality, when the political sphere takes ownership about values, is a reality when we cannot agree to disagree. There is no option. I cannot disagree with this. There is nothing here to disagree. If I say this is not true, now I'm, I'm you know, the enemy and extreme and, and racism or, or racist or anything. To go against the uh, political values, this marks the citizen as not legitimate, as racist, and etc. The political sphere rephrase the values in a way that did not enable us as citizen to create civil and public sphere and not enable us to hold different approach. Now, what am I suggest? What is my suggestion? Am I suggesting that we won't agree about anything? No, this is anarchy. Of course, I'm not suggesting it. Am I suggesting to say that nothing means nothing? No, of course not. Every citizen should have the right to fight for the value he cares about. And if we do an inquiry, we as citizens, we may find out that there are established values who can gain public support much more than we saw. What we should not be doing is to give the political institution to arrange it for us, to give the state to decide for us how, what is our, what is the meaning of our values. The political sphere should, we have to bring values inside the political sphere. There is no other choice, but we should do it very, very carefully. And our job as the public, as the people, as citizens, is to pay attention is very good. What exactly is the political sphere, the state? What is it doing with our values? And not to agree to the deconstruction of our values in the name of imaginary civil consent, because the political sphere, it doesn't have a permission to redesign our values as it wants without our permission as the people, as the citizen in a democracy. 
that's it. Thank you that's so it. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> which gave us a lot of food for thought to chew on and trying to digest. So thank you, Lila. Uh, the floor is open. We have about 20 minutes uh, or so, a good 15 minutes uh, for questions. Okay. Any questions? I hope uh, I'm not giving you a headache. <laughs> uh, any questions? If not, um, let me see if there are any questions from the chat. Corey, could you just, no? Um, then I will take, or I will try to, generate a value-driven discussion. I mean, Lilak, are you essentially suggesting that the, if there is such a thing as proper or Leibovician politics, that it should be entirely value-free? Because towards the end of the talk, you almost suggested that it's really not possible, but you really don't want it to be there. But I mean, I, ideas, ideologies, they are all filled, of course, value-based. Values are fundamental to how I at least think about political life, political conflict, uh, maybe I should rethink them. So just how realistic is it? Or where is really the proper place? Uh, and what happens to politics if you remove values from it? So what should political debates be about? Taxation, money only? Um, technical matters, what? Well, first, as I said, and I totally agree, you were suggesting something that's a very Leibovician thing to do, you know, to offer something. If we had more time, I would speak about it more, say you should do something, but it's not possible. But that's exactly the same. It's not like, from one hand, we're not supposed to say no values inside the political field because then the state will like paralyze. The state has to speak in the name of values, like no matter how you look on it. But we should be very, we should not be careful. We should be very, very, very careful when we are letting the state to do permission. Like the state will do whatever it wants. This is the state. The political sphere is very powerful. It won't wait for our permission to do anything. What needs to be done is for us to make sure there is a proper discussion. There is a public discussion. Like, let's see what, if I'm coming back to the examples after this redefining antisemitism, I wanted to hear a big, protest against it. I didn't hear. Like people were saying, Ho oh, is is not smart of saying that uh, it, or is that was very stupid thing to do. No, that was very smart thing to do. It's not stupid to say that. That was not a mistake that he made. That was very smart. And and there is not real discussion. It enables us to see what is going on when you just reshaping values the way you want. We can't, we cannot change the political, but what we supposed to be able to do in a democracy was to have discussion, like proper discussion, and to say, wait a minute, I didn't give you a permission to redefine anti-Semitism. You are speaking in the name of the Jewish in Israel, and even for a second in the name of, I don't know, the Jewish in the world, okay, you are just redesign anti-Semitism. This is, no, how can you say that? And again, in, in the, in when it comes to conversion, I can't speak in the, uh, because I teach conversion, and you can see what the public thinks about this. The public is not, is disagree with Malinowski. Go to most of the people in Israel, they understand very nice and very bright that even when someone is not keeping, nobody's keeping everything. I'm religious, I've tried to do my best with keeping all the halakha and all the, the Torah. But nobody's doing any everything. But things like that, it just, you know, it just slips. If we're not careful, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not speaking with the politician. Politician will be politician. I'm speaking with the public, with us. We are the one to be careful. Okay. I'll be the devil's advocate. No, please, of course. What about, I mean, I don't want to support that, that statement, which seems, I don't know, my trained eyes are unusually silly. Uh, they read, uh, tend to redefine anti Semitism, but one could argue that if you don't let the political be the final arbiter of, of important principles, then you run the risk of having civil, serious civil uh, people in. And I was just, maybe I'm being influenced. I'm just teaching Hobbes right now. And so it's oh, you're teaching Hobbes. Yeah, right now. And so Hobbes would say, well, but ultimately you need to have that final authority. And, and if you allow, especially, and of course for him, the religious question is particularly important. If you allow religious leaders to, in effect, 
claim for themselves authority to 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 decide whether or not certain uh, commands from the sovereign are are, are to be uh, obeyed or not, then you will have very quickly a uh, great upheaval in the first case scenario of civil war. So, so is there not a case to be made for the people that politically should have less? And, and, and when it comes to the values as well. Yeah, that, that's so interesting that you're teaching Hobbes because Leibovitch was a Hobbesian very much. He was talking about Hobbes, like he didn't mention like anyone, any political thinker, but he was talking about Hobbes and he would say, we have, state is very, very important because otherwise we will kill each other yeah. because very Hobbesian point of view. And, but the weird thing that he was saying this and he said, but be very, very careful from the state. Like he didn't go with Hobbes all the way, say the state should have all the power and then we should do anything that we can to balance it. But from Hobbesian point of view, you know, the state is so powerful, it's a Leviathan. So what you're doing is like, uh, you, you're not really can do something because the state always has the last word. Mm -hmm. He was not worried the state should be weak because the, uh, the state will manage, the political will manage. We could just, you know, maybe try to do a, a, an eternal effort to do something. But you would never dream of like breaking the state or anarchy or, or something. But like doesn't that. that presuppose, in a way, a certain weakening of the of, of certain perspectives? I think, especially the religious perspective, that really in the earlier times were very powerful and could represent a threat to global authority. In a sense that we assume the kind of niceness, liberal niceness, that we've come to to take for granted that people are not willing to push disagreements so far that they they're willing to really essentially. I see the, the political order break down over certain important questions. So can we take that into account? Uh, take that for granted that this 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 continuation of this this niceness, this you know, ultimately the state has to have that important. Yeah, you know? you're saying that we can discuss okay. uh, as much as we like, and yet we should be very careful yeah. about it. Yeah, I, I'm agree, but I'm coming from like the point from my point of view. Nobody should take care of the state. So you're asking, are you sure nobody should take care of the state? You're saying that you will say and say that eventually you will, the state will collapse. So I don't think the state will collapse. And I think if the state is collapsing is because it has weak civil society and democracy should be representing the people. And it cannot do because hopes, as I understand him, he was not a big Democrat. I didn't, but I don't understand it as believing in a democracy, believing in stable. So I agree that, of course, there are limits that should be taken into consideration. Like you have like COVID now, I'm not sure we can have this ongoing debate about what to do when people are, you know, basically dying. So some choice had to be made. That, that. But the state is not even smart, it's just powerful and it, it will do it eventually. Um, but yeah, you are like where exactly to put the balance. Let's say that if in Israel and eventually in democracy, we have such a powerful civic consent, maybe I should start to be worried it's too powerful, we should not get the state yeah, so, yeah. so weak. But that was never the proposal of language. Anyone else from the room, from the chat? Then um, let me offer another volley of questions just to follow up on some of the issues and maybe introduce a few new ones in the time remaining. Three short questions, but the questions are short. Maybe the answers will take us a little bit longer. Okay. So what did Lagovich actually mean by the Jewish state? Uh, one, two, um, the way you talk about it, maybe that's not you, maybe that's that's Lagovich and, and the thinkers that you engage. The view of the state that I'm walking away with from this talk is a very, as you said, demonic, powerful, monolithic Levi Leviathan. Yeah. But you're coming from Israel. The Israeli state is anything but. More, many states that I'm familiar with, that I interact with, it's anything but. Our state... I mean, we have a very well-functioning uh, state in Canada, but it's weakened also by so many institutions. Um, federalism, we have a strong court uh, that keeps a check on the uh, on the political executive and on the political. Uh, we have, um, and, and Israel certainly also has a number of institutional, but not just features, that really fragment the political. So if you 
look at a fragmented political sphere, do, do you really have to be worried about it? And I understand that Leibovitch came from a, a European context where anti-Semitism was raging and it was uh, fomented and, and stirred up by states. So I understand the historical legacy, but does it really apply to a much more, to the context of much more fragmented uh, or political spheres, if you will? And finally, on a personal note, you're, you told us that you were going uh, back to vote, at least in this election coming up, uh, until the next one presents itself on the horizon. Will you think about values when you deposit uh, your ballot uh, or your sleep, uh, your patek in the ballot box? And if so, are you not delegating the, are you not giving a mandate to whomever you will be voting for to represent your values? If you do that, are you just not contradicting your own theory? So. Wow. <laughs> hey, first about what Leibovitch means when he's talking about the Jewish state, uh, he doesn't know. Okay, okay so he's saying, you have a Jewish state, we have a Jewish state, but Judaism is to its own. Obviously, this state is not only Jewish state, so I don't know what does that mean. This, he called this the horrible question of the Jewish people today. This is horrible because we don't know what it means, and maybe in a couple of years we will redefine Judaism and we will redefine what it is to be Jewish. So he doesn't know. Uh, I will skip for a second for the third question. I, I, I have a reason. What am I thinking about when I'm going to the to vote? Like I'm doing this a lot, so I, I can answer you. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about values. Am I contradicting myself? Of course, I'm studying labor, which I have to contradict myself. But I have to tell you that this election for me is not about values, is whether is I want Israel to be a democracy. And I want that we could agree to this degree. I don't feel today that in Israel. You can agree to disagree, and it's a problem if you're neither good or bad. So if you're saying something, it's neither good or bad. That that's mean that we don't have a real discussion in Israel. We don't have real a uh, public sphere in Israel. So I'm not even thinking about values right now. I want the state to be a democracy. I didn't mean to, put, to, I'm, I'm, to I'm, say anything. To I'm, sharing, I'm sharing the meeting so I can actually, for the next five minutes or so, I could actually be abusive of my role, and I will. But are you saying then that democracy is not a value to you? No. Uh, Labour which saying democracy is not a value. Democracy is Interesting. Um, okay. a way, a regime. Okay. okay? Yeah. What values this democracy yeah. enables? This is like... A question, yeah. but democracy yeah. by Sorry, itself constantly. again. This is like, can you say democracy is only uh, what is it? Just a need? It's a fact? No, it's a bit of a value. But I'm not addressing because Leibovitch is not. Can you please? I I will, I will rely on Leibovitch here. I will feel more yeah. confident. Is not addressing democracy like roles and like liberals addressing mm -hmm. democracy. We have democracy values. He's saying there is not just a thing, and he's not the only one saying this in Israel. We have democracy, we have like the method. Now we need to decide what values. Now on, on your second, I think this is like, um, how do you say, this is a weak spot, I think, for me. Mm -hmm. And I need to think about it. What does that mean? I said the political, now I'm criticizing myself now. You said, I said, that the political sphere is demonic and powerful, but I didn't under, I explain what exactly is how we can see that it's powerful. It's powerful that it can use values, it can do harm, but if you have institution and they're like crumbling, is that mean that the public political sphere is powerful or is that mean that it's weak? This is something that I don't think I address enough in my dissertation and I need to think about when, because obviously it's very powerful, okay. But you feel and you, uh, but you come to the state and you feel that the state, like the, such institutions are out working, are, are in, in danger. So is the political still powerful? And if it's not, where all the power go? So I need to think about that. Thank right. you so much. So that one. one last look. Uh, yes, yes, Randy, please. I just add my uh, wondering, is there any examples that you feel like it actually has been something that you feel that um, 
like civil society has been able to sort of contest the state and sort of demand to have representation and like anything that's like a hopeful anecdote that people can sort of use as a case study to emulate and strive for. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I didn't have the time to speak about it like a lot, so I will say it very shortly. Actually, regarding conversion in Israel, there was 20 years ago, there was a committee in Israel called Vadat Neman because there was a big issue in Israel how we should approach conversion because there is only half, today almost half a million in Israel are not Jewish and they're not belong to any other religion. And there was starting to be a problem in Israel because people couldn't get married. And so Netanyahu, who was then also prime minister, established this committee. And this committee has a lot, a lot of discussion. And this committee was very broad, like it has different streams. It has conservative rabbi, reformed rabbi, orthodox. They were talking a lot and meet with people to deal, how to deal and how to attack this problem. And what is interesting is that the committee decided of a few things that the government should do, but it couldn't reach to a point of agreement. It could only write like, this is what we think should be done. But then the head of the committee, Neman, Jacob Neman, he, he said that, okay, there is no agreement. He just took everything the committee say. He went to the government and the government applied everything. So today I teach conversion because of Vadat Neman. So I think this is very interesting because the government only has to endorse it. And the government, not only the government, also a lot part of the opposition in Israel also endorsed this Barat Neeman. And what this committee did, they like, they talk and talk and talk, every discussion after discussion after discussion. And they, they couldn't reach an agreement eventually. But what was interesting that they were able to understand what the public in Israel really feel about conversion, the majority, not everybody, feels about conversion. They decided to have today, if you want to do conversion, you come and study. And where I teach, you have a committee and in the board where I teach, you have rabbis from all the streams in Judaism, from conversion and conservative and uh, from reform and conservative and orthodox. But the conversion is by uh, the orthodox halakha. And you see the people in Israel, they are accepting this conversion. So it's was even, it was took, it was something the political enabled. Again, the political enabled this. But this committee had a real discussion about, and it changed a bit again the reality without any politician to get intervene in the way and try to take it to his. So this is not the best example. This is just an example of, of my head. And again, your question is good. Like, are there our, um, examples or are there are cases that we want the state to do something differently and the state hears us and say, okay, I hear you. You want to do something differently. Okay, is it protest? Is it newspaper? Is it the press? For example, because there are also politi uh, liberal thinkers who write about it, like I didn't have the time, but Habermas, for example, is, is a political thinker who writes about this exactly. You have to create a sphere when the state can understand what you want, and not a sphere when all you care is gain, gain power or gain money. So this is an example, I'm sure it's not perfect example. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, that uh, let me ask uh, the group here and maybe in person and maybe those who are joining us on Zoom in a virtual fashion to express our gratitude to you, Lilak, for uh, spending this afternoon with us and Thank bringing so a very different kind of material to, to our seminar room, to our table. Uh, it's not every day that we get to hear about Yeshaya Bulaibovic uh, in uh, our neck of the woods. So, uh, uh, and of course, hear about... Uh, Thinking, we hear a lot about Israel, but not philosophically, the way you have uh, painted this picture. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.